believe it or not, next month, the end of next month, we're going to celebrate Easter. And we just finished Christmas, but it's almost Easter. So for the next couple of months, I'd call it a season of preparation. As we are, we're going to focus our attention as we're moving toward the cross and the empty tomb. We're going to focus our attention particularly on Jesus. And during the month of February, we're going to look at the man who introduced Jesus to the world. Uh, his job was to prepare the way of the Lord. And believe it or not, Jesus called this man the greatest person who ever lived. Now, that's hard to live up to, isn't it? This guy is the greatest person who has ever lived. Out of all the people who have ever walked the face of the earth, he says, this guy is something. And you really need to pay attention to him. He's the greatest. He says this in Luke chapter 7. These are the words of Jesus. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. And the John that he's talking about is John the baptizer. Sometimes we call him John the Baptist. He's the greatest person who's ever lived. That's what Jesus said. I bet none of you learned about John the Baptist in your high school or college history class. They didn't mention him. And here Jesus said he's the greatest person who ever lived. In fact, you might have come to church all your life and never heard many sermons about this man named John. Uh, you probably don't know much about him at all. Most people only know that he wore strange clothes made of camel hair and that he ate sort of wilderness food because he lived out in the desert. But, uh, and, and we skip over him. I think a lot of times we go, oh yeah, it was John the Baptist. We're trying to get to Jesus. Well, uh, Jesus said, hey, don't, don't skip so fast because this guy is one of the greatest of human beings. And he was tasked with something by God and he did it well. So for the next few weeks, we're going to take Jesus' advice and spend some time on this man who came to prepare the way of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. This is not John the Baptist chapter 1. This is another John, John the disciple. And uh, John tells us, he, he starts in chapter 1 with the story of Jesus' ministry. He said, John was out in a remote location doing what God had called him to do. And what he's doing is he's calling people to turn from their sin, to uh, repent, and then to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Lord, this long-awaited uh, Messiah or Savior. And they're to prepare by being baptized. And, and they're, coming, they're coming to be baptized at this location out in the desert, which is next to the Jordan River. Now, basically, I think what John, his message was, hey, get your heart right so that when the Savior shows up, you'll be ready for him. Now, I also want you to note that um, John was not calling the extra bad people to repent. He didn't say, okay, if you're a real sinner, you need to repent. No, he was calling everybody to repent. Uh, religious leaders, Roman soldiers, uh, working class people, scholars, rich, poor, um, crowds of people were flocking out, again, to this remote location to hear him preach and uh, Hundreds and hundreds of them were being baptized. Now, the, this baptism really is symbolic for getting your heart clean. I mean, it's not what we do when we baptize someone here, but it is, he, he said, come and 
get in the water and, and wash yourself. Uh, get yourself ready, purified. And people were expectant of something that was really great. The, Mes- the Messiah, the Savior, was coming and uh, he said, and he's going to be revealed to us very soon. And so the word had gotten out about what was going on out in the desert. Um, Everyone in Israel knows about John, what John is doing. It said King Herod in his palace, he didn't go out there, but he he knew about John the Baptist. Uh, People back in Jerusalem... In the in, people that were serving the temple, they, they knew about what was going on, that there was this uh, spiritual revival going on because of John the Baptist. And it says that they were a little bit concerned about John, so they sent a delegation of some of their leaders out to uh, the Jordan River to, to ask John some questions. And the, the questions were basically these, you know, who, who do you think you are? I mean, who gave you permission to be baptizing people and calling them to repent? I mean, uh, who are you? That's, that's really what they were saying. Uh, who are you? And, and look what it says. It says, now, this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. See, he gives the same answer to all of the questions. They said, are you the Christ? By the way, Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah or the Savior, the long-awaited Savior. They said, are you the Christ that we've been waiting for all these years? And he said, I'm not. They said, what, are you Elijah? Now, why Elijah? Elijah was, by all accounts, everyone considered Elijah the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He, He did all kinds of incredible miracles, and he called down fire from heaven. He was an amazing person. And he didn't die like most people. He was whisked away on a chariot of fire to heaven. And the prophet Malachi said, and before the the long-awaited Messiah, someone like Elijah would come. And so they said, are you Elijah? And he said, nope. They said, well then... Are you a prophet? Now, for 400 years, there had been no prophet in Israel. It's like the voice of God had gone silent. No one was speaking for God. No no prophet to come and share a word of the Lord. I said, are you a prophet? And he said, no. I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice out here in the desert calling people to get their hearts ready for the coming of the Lord. Now, one of the reasons that John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, was was so great was that he was incredibly humble. I mean, hordes of people are traveling out to see him. They want to hear him preach. They want to be baptized by him. Hey, y'all, this guy was a rock star in his days. Everybody knew about John. Everybody wanted to see this crazy guy with his camel hair vest. 
Everybody wanted to come out to see him. He's generating the spiritual revival all over Israel. And they say, are you the one we've been waiting for? And he said, oh, no. No, that's not me. I'm just an average guy. I'm just an average, ordinary guy doing what God told him to do. Now listen, it, it takes a lot of humility to know who you are and, to, and, and, and who you're not, I would say. Uh, to know your role, to know your place, to know what your calling is when everybody else is trying to get you to be someone you're not. Everybody's saying, well, who, you know, who are you? Or, I mean, t- tell us about yourself. Tell us, tell us about your authority. And uh, all John can say is, no, I, I'm nothing special. So jot this down, this truth. This is about humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that is a true definition of the way that John operated in his life. He didn't say he wasn't called to be someone great because the angel told his father, hey, he will be great from the day he was born. He didn't say, I don't have the Holy Spirit because the Spirit was upon him from birth, it says. Uh, He doesn't say, hey... um, I'm not a good leader, don't follow me, don't listen to my preaching. No, he didn't say any of those things. He just knows his role. And his role is to point to someone else who is greater than he is. And listen to, this is another place, listen to this humble statement by John. He says, he must become greater, I must become less. In one version it says, he's got to increase, that means i got to decrease. So here I am, I'm, I'm famous, people are coming out to me, but I realize uh, all, I want all the attention to go to him because he's way greater than me. So let me, let me just pause right there. I mean, anybody here like to be great? I mean, great in the, the eyes of the Lord, okay? Now, some of you are worried. If you say yes, that sounds like you know, you're arrogant, you're not very humble. But in your heart, uh, wouldn't, you like to, wouldn't you like to be a great person in the eyes of the Lord? Well, one of the character traits is certainly is humility. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, think about it like this. Pride has a stench. You can smell an arrogant person coming. But humility has a fragrance, has an aroma that is beautiful to God. And so, I think John the Baptist was a guy who lived outside, smelled like he slept out in the woods, but he still had a beautiful aroma of humility on him. Well, those guys went back to Jerusalem and I believe they reported in to the Jewish ruling council. And those men, those leaders were not satisfied with John's answers. And so they sent another delegation back out from Jerusalem is in the mountains. So down, they came down the mountain. They went down to the Jordan River to be able to speak to John again. It says, now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? This is what John said. I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. They say, hey, if you're not the Messiah, and you're not Elijah, you're not some 
special prophet, then why are you baptizing? Why, why are you out here doing that? He says, well, I'll tell you, I'm out here baptizing with water because there's one who's coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, he's already here. He just hasn't been revealed yet. But when he is, you'll see, he is so much greater than me. Now, it's an interesting comment that John ends with here. Because he talks about just how much greater the one who is coming after him is going to be. And he talks about, it, he talks about the guy's sandals. Now, here's the background to that. In those days... When you wanted uh, spiritual mentorship or you wanted more education, you did not sign up to go to a university or a seminary. You signed up to be the follower of a great teacher. In fact, you'd go to the teacher and you'd say, may I enlist as one of your students? That The word for that is disciple. May I be your disciple? And so you see, Jesus had 12 close disciples who followed him around all the time. He's a great teacher. We want to learn from you. We want to learn your ways. And so you spend time with the teacher. You eat with the teacher. You, you spend every waking hour that you have with the teacher. And students would become close to their teacher so much so they do anything for them. They'd serve them in any way. It was like, hey, I'm the student, you're the master, I'll do anything. And that was true for most students. They would do anything for their teacher except one thing, wash his feet. Because pulling off someone's uh, sweaty, smelly, nasty sandals and touching their feet, which had been everywhere, walking through dirt and mud and trash and manure in those days, was considered to be the lowest of low menial tasks. And so not even a student would do that for his teacher. And look what John says. John says, listen, um, he is this much greater than me. Even if I were willing to stoop down and untie his sandals, I'm not worthy of even that position. That's how great he is. Now, the second reason why John the baptizer was so great is he had the heart of a servant. He says, I, I'm here not for my own benefit. I'm here to serve him. I'm here to announce him and he is so much greater than me and so I'll serve him in any possible way I would even wash his feet but I'm not even worthy to get down on my hands and knees and do that compared to him you know, someone asked Jesus one time oh, what is the definition of greatness how, how does someone become great in your eyes and Jesus said, whoever wants to be, become great among you must be your servant. You must learn how to serve other people. Now, jot down this truth. Um, greatness is not based on what you do. It's based on who you do it for. And so the truth is, if you're doing it for Jesus, then what you're doing is great because he's great. John says, I'll do whatever it takes to announce him and to, to put him forth because he is so much greater than me. So I just pause again. Hey, anybody here want to be great? If you want to be great, uh, the character trait is you got to be a servant. You got to be willing to do whatever to be able to promote the one that you are serving. In fact, one of the first verses I ever memorized 
was Colossians 3.17 that says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do will be just great because He's great. But do it in His name. If you're washing dishes, if you're reading your Bible, if you're... Uh, doing something for someone. Do it in the name of the Lord Jesus because you're a servant. Now, I want to I tell you something pretty amazing about John's baptizing and announcing of Jesus. And it is this. Uh, apparently, John did all of this, all of his preaching, all the baptizing, he did everything out in the wilderness, not knowing who he was announcing. He didn't know it was his cousin, his relative, that he would be announcing. Uh, he just did it because God told him, I want you to go out there and I want you to tell people to get ready because in due time he will be revealed to you. It'll be clear who this person is. Now, you've got to imagine, it takes a humble person to not know all the details, right? Just to go do it because God told him to do it and to, to not be told the details. I mean, all of us want the details, don't we? Okay, God, that's fine. I'll go do it, but why? God, I mean, well, well, well what if? What if these things? John said, um, yes, sir, I will go out and I will do exactly what you have called me to do. Uh, look at these two statements by John. He says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed in Israel. Then he says, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. Now, just briefly, you ever wondered why Jesus went to be baptized in the first place? I mean, I understand about all those other people. They needed to get ready. They needed to repent of their sin because they had sin. But Jesus didn't have any sin to get rid of. Jesus did not have any reason to be baptized like they did. Uh, they were baptized for the remission of sin. We all get that. Jesus went to be baptized so that he could be revealed to the whole world. So his baptism was, was his great announcement to the whole world that he had arrived that he was here. He is the savior of the world. The baptism would reveal that to everyone, especially to John. In fact, John, at the baptism of Jesus, when he, when he understands who it is, he makes three amazing identifications of Jesus. Three, he says three things about him. And he announces them, as, as you just read, we just read a minute ago. It says, he confessed these things boldly and humbly. He says, I want to tell you who it is that you are now beholding. The first thing he says is, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Verse 29, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is an amazing statement that he makes here. And apparently, it was revealed to him by God that Jesus is more than just a carpenter or a teacher or a relative. He's actually the Savior. And he says, he is the Lamb of God. Now, that title goes back to the Old Testament. Actually, goes back to... <coughs> goes back to the book of Exodus where Moses was told by God, go to the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let my people go. Tell, them to tell him to release them 
from slavery. I want them to come and worship me. I want to take them to a land that I've promised them. And the Pharaoh, time after time, said no. Finally, God told Moses, go back one more time, and this is what I want you to tell the king of Egypt. Tell him, there's going to be one more sign of my power and my authority. And this time, you will let my people go. He said, tomorrow night, in every house in Egypt, the firstborn person will die. In every house, including yours. And the reason that they're going to die is because of your disobedience. Let that be known right now. It is because of you, king, that all these people are going to perish. He says, then it'll happen in every house, including all the Israelite houses, unless you take a lamb, and it has to be a perfect lamb. It has to be a, an unblemished, uh, without any kind of spot or defect. You sacrifice that lamb, and you take the blood, and you paint your doorpost with that blood. And if you'll do that, then tomorrow night, when all this is taking place, the wrath of God will pass over that house and your family, and you'll be spared. You take this lamb, and you'll be, you'll be saved. That's why we call that, that was called the Passover. This is a Passover lamb. And that tradition continued throughout the Old Testament that the sacrifice for sin was a lamb. And this lamb was sacrificed regularly. Each person often would bring a lamb for their family. Uh, every day in the morning and the evening, there would be a sacrifice of a lamb for the sins of the people. On the Day of Atonement, there would be a, a, a huge sacrifice, and the blood would be poured out. It was all pointing back to a lamb without defect must die for the sins of the people. And then Jesus came, and God revealed to John, guess what? No more lambs. Because look, there is the Lamb. He is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the whole world. And He is here. And there He is. Right there in the flesh. Listen, today, when we take communion together, there's a picture of the Lamb. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for us. It was done one time. It never needs to be repeated because He is so great. No other lamb would ever do now. He is the Lamb of God. It's why you read in the book of Revelation, who is sitting on the throne of God? The Lamb. It's why we sing. Sometimes, I'm sure if you're a new Christian, you're going, who is the Lamb? It's Jesus. He's the lamb who was slain for us. And he is so great that there never needs to be a sacrifice again. John said, look, it's the lamb of God. He also says, look, he is full of the Holy Spirit. He is, he is spirit filled. He says, the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John said, listen, when I baptized Jesus, an amazing thing happened. He said, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. I saw it. And it stayed on him. Now, I could preach a whole message on that one right there, just that one sentence. But let me explain quickly what that means. Instead of the Holy Spirit coming and going, Jesus, who was fully God, set aside his divinity and became like you and me. And how was he able to 
do miraculous signs and perform miracles and speak boldly and know things. Well, because the Holy Spirit came on him as a human being and stayed. He said, the one on whom the Holy Spirit comes and stays is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Meaning, he's the one who is going to give everyone else the Holy Spirit. And listen, when you put your trust in Jesus, something miraculous happens. The Holy Spirit comes and stays in us so that we, we're not average, ordinary anymore. We are filled with the Holy Ghost. We are different people. He says, look, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit came on him and stayed. And then he says one more thing. Jesus is the Son of God. He says, I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Now, how does he know that? Well, one thing. Jesus told John, I need you to baptize me. John said, you've got to be kidding. You need to baptize me. You're so much greater than me. I'm not worthy to even be in your presence. He goes, no, I need you to baptize me so that everyone will know who I am. And I want you to watch and listen as you're baptizing me. So John baptized Jesus. And John said, as Jesus was coming out of the water, not only did the, the Spirit come down on him, he said, but it was like a voice from heaven and he said and I heard it with my own ears God himself said this is my son with whom I am well pleased so he said not only is he the Lamb of God not only is he full of the Spirit y'all this is the Son of God there is no one like him I step back in awe because he is the only one worthy of that title. Goes back to our catechism question, doesn't it? I believe in Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. And so John said, don't look at me. You look at him. Listen, I am not that great, and he puts all of us to shame with his greatness. He gets all the, the glory, all the authority. I, I step back. Uh, I have one job. It is to point to him. I've come to prepare the way for him. And my heart is ready to receive him. My heart is ready to point to him. And if you think about it, that is exactly what our job is. My job is not to point to me. My job is to point to him because he is really the greatest. So, Lord, thank you for this word today. So grateful for this man named John. What a, what a humble servant indeed. And, Lord, would you make us into humble servants of Jesus right in the image of John so that we might point to you that we might step back and not call attention to ourselves but also we might point other people to you because you indeed are great and we love you in Jesus name Amen